is the letters of Paul, part one. <laughs> so uh, whenever we look at the, the, you know, again, it's one of these lessons that uh, each, they have three divisions, and part one, the first part is being made right with God, that's in Romans, and the second part is the apostolic correction and counsel, that's in 1 Corinthians, and the pastoral care and instruction is in Timothy and Titus. Now, each one of those thing, uh, each one of those division is a lesson in itself. <laughs> so, it's um, sometimes it's over overstuffed, and sometimes it's like, can't you give me any more on this? No, we're not going to get through this one either. It's just it's just uh, a lot of good things. And the first one, especially being made made right with God, is an an excellent um, study. For us to, for anyone to look at, and to, if we could understand it, and make the application of that to our lives, uh, it would be, um, we'd be much better off. All right. So, the it begins by talking about the enabling power of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. That the church, you know, people were um, baptized in the Holy Spirit, and five thousand were added to the church daily, and thousands thereafter. Now. They, if you look at this, we'd say, well, that's, you know, that's great. Rapid growth. Um, there's uh, missionary journeys of Paul, which we are looking at today. You, you see all this growth. And then, of course, the, um, the persecution by Saul of Tarsus, Paul, before he's changed, how that that forced the church out of Jerusalem and sent them to other areas. And now it's, it's kind of ironic. You have Paul who is on his way to Tarsus to arrest and persecute and drag those Christians back to, back to Jerusalem and put them on trial, while his fierce um, hatred of the church drives the church out, and then he gets converted, and now he goes out to those church of those areas where he chased all the Christians to, and he now starts churches. <laughs> so I thought that, that's kind of funny. So, I thought it was funny, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah well, he, he, he gets up, he gets to where he's supposed to be. God says, you're going to go to Rome, and he goes to Rome as a prisoner rather than a preacher, but he did better off as a prisoner and a preacher than on his own. So, anyhow... <clears throat> Um, as these individuals, uh, you know, in these different communities where Paul goes, as they find Christ um, through his ministry, the local fellowships, churches were established in the homes and in, you know, sometimes in, in um, uh, public meeting places, but most of the time it was in their homes. And so the, the, the uh, need for teaching and grounding new believers um, what the tenets of faith is. It's more than just, I believe in Jesus. There's more to it. You've got, there's a whole, you know, what does that mean to believe in Christ? And so Paul, when he's writing these letters, he's, he's helping them to gather the information about you, you, you've believed in Jesus Christ, that he rose from the dead, and he's forgiven you of your sins. Now, what else goes with this? <laughs> How else do you govern yourself as a, as a body? And so he's... Um, now coming in and writing these letters, in this case Romans, about church government and how that they are to govern themselves along with how that they are basically on the same plane <laughs> as being forgiven and in Christ and you know, not one is better than the other. So, so this uh, expansion <laughs> brought on a new problem. One, the question arose that if Gentiles receive Jesus as the Messiah and Savior, what degree, should the, what degree should they be required to observe the law of Moses? Remember, the church began in Jerusalem with Jews, with the Jewish people, with the Jewish faith. And now that the church has gone out to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles are coming in, and they by faith are accepting Christ, while now the Jewish believers, you know, they, you know, they adhere to the law of Moses. So here you have these new converts, Gentiles, coming in, and they don't, they don't adhere to the law of Moses. So something's got to give here. So there's problems between these two, these two groups. And um, Gentiles entering the Christian fellowship solely on faith 
And while the Jews were, you know, Old Testament prophets and circumcision and all these things, you've got to do all these things to belong. So anyhow, Paul on his return, <laughs> his return of his first missionary trip, he goes back, he, he, you know, he makes his rounds and then he goes back through the churches on his way home to, or back to Jerusalem. So um, Paul, he's this, you know, he not only has the heart of an evangelist, but he has the heart of a, being a pastor, teacher, um, grounding people in the work. So new believers, both Jews and Gentiles, I thought this was important. New believers, both Jews and Gentiles, needed to cut their ties to the past. The ceremonial, law, the ceremonial laws for the Jews and the familiar pagan practices, practices for Gentiles, as well as deep-rooted prejudices, sinful tendencies, and misconceptions of God. <laughs> so you have, you have these two groups of people who have entirely different concepts about the supernatural. You have the Jewish believers that tie into the Old Testament, into the sacrificial system, into the laws of, of Judaism, and then you have the Gentiles who, you know, they worship in these temples and worship other gods and, you know, they, these pagan practices, and they, they, you know, they're drawn to that. And so you have these two extremes in one church. I don't think I wanted to be their pastor. <laughs> You know, it's hard enough just, you know, not here. This is wonderful here, but in other places. It, I mean, people come in with, you wouldn't believe the people, how, what ideas people come into the church with, and, and they don't let them go, you know? But anyhow, that's a different story. So um, Paul's letters continue to be, now, you know, I heard, this, this commentary says that Paul's letters, uh, can, you know, his letters make up more than a fourth of the, uh, of the New Testament. And then I have another person say, well, Paul's letters make up almost half of the New Testament. So it's somewhere between a quarter and a half, you know, so he, his writings. So in the other lesson, the other statement it makes is that next to, next to Jesus Christ himself, next on the list would be Paul that had made the greatest influence on the church. Um, so his conversion, uh, you know, but it's, it's different. It's, it's kind of unique in the sense that the disciples, whenever they, they came to know, after Jesus died, rose from the dead in the in Pentecost, the disciples were kind of like allocated to Jerusalem, okay? They basically stayed in Jerusalem. <laughs> they didn't venture out because that was kind of like the head of the church. That was the head of where they felt they should be because their, most of their life centered around Galilee and Jerusalem. Well, Paul comes along, and Paul's conversion and, you know, Peter, even though Peter went out to, to the house of Cornelius and started ministering to the Gentiles, um, Paul, he, you know, he was off and running <laughs> to these missionary journeys to the round, uh, around the different areas in the, the then known world. So the first section is in Romans chapter 1 and in verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Um, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold truth in unrighteousness. Now, I, I looked this up in a different version. It says, God's way of making people right begins and ends with faith. Okay, faith to faith. So, our, uh, we... we our righteousness and our relationship with Jesus Christ begins with faith. And so it begins with faith. And then it says, those who hold uh, truth, okay. Um, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. The evil lives hide the truth that they have. Hmm. So people, you know, evil people doing evil deeds, there is truth in there. And the Bible is saying there, this is Paul is saying here, these evil, de these, this, this truth of righteousness is held captive by the, um, the, the, the lies or the evilness that they, that they surround it with. And, and if you, you know, we think, uh, you know, we're talking on Wednesday nights about the judgment and, you know, all that, um, that people will be held accountable for what they've done with Christ. And, you know, everyone that stands before God and, 
and their name is not in the book of life, they will know the truth that they had in their life that they hid and suppressed with all their evilness. And that will be a great punishment. That's kind of what this is saying here. So the epistle to Rome focuses on two things, man's sin and God's righteousness. Um, what else here? Um, throughout this epistle, Paul explains how God reveals and imparts his nature to us through faith. Okay, Now, I, I wanted to read that because it's important that how does God impart his nature into our lives? And that impartation of God's divine nature into our lives is called righteousness. So righteousness in the biblical sense has to do with being in a right relationship with God. So here we have the righteousness of God, God's nature, being imparted into us by faith. And so what we are doing whenever we believe in Jesus and we're asking God for guidance and we're reading the scriptures and wanting to know and, and, and interpret it correctly, we are allowing the nature of God to help us understand what the scriptures are saying to us and how that the righteousness of God is righteousness in us. You know, it, it says that Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him as righteousness. I always struggled with that little phrase because whenever we believe God, it's God's righteousness that he gives to us because we have faith in him. You know, it isn't like I have faith and if I have enough faith, I can get righteous, I can get this package of righteousness from God, pull it off the shelf and I can own it. <laughs> no, faith in God automatically opens the door for God's righteousness, our right relationship with God. That righteousness comes into our lives and is part of our makeup. So uh, when Paul is, yes. Yes, Abraham's father, but this, I, I, you know, and I never, I never, um, I didn't follow through with the, this thought once. Once uh, Abraham's father was called to do what Abraham did, but he only made it from, uh, from where he was to Ur of the Chaldees, and then he stopped. And he took up idol making in Ur of the Chaldees, where he was at. Abraham grew up in that home, and God's call then came upon Abraham. And Abraham left and went into the land. So Abraham's father was called, but he, he, didn't, he didn't follow through with it. So then, and he turned to worship, worshiping idols. Uh, and, but Abraham followed through with the call and left and went to the land of promise to where we now know as Israel. Yes. Now, I, uh, I've heard that, but I haven't explored it. There's just like one or two verses there that talk about it. And it's like you have to really look at those and say, oh, yeah. And I, had, I heard somebody else talk about that, so... I said, oh, yeah, that just, you know, it is in there, but I never sit down and <laughs> sit down and read it over and read it over and figured out what he was saying. But anyhow, that was, um, I, I've heard that spoken of. I just never went back and pulled it out and looked at it. So it's a, it's a good possibility, let's put it that way. All right. Um, so righteousness in the biblical sense has to do with right being right in relationship to God, being right in our relationship to God, being right in our relationship. So being right in our relationship is that there's nothing stands between God and I, means our sins are forgiven and that they are covered, you know, Christ covers them, washes us, and we have this right relationship with God. So God's righteousness then comes into, into play. So God's judicial declaration of our righteousness. Now, judicial, you know, it has something to do with the, the, the legal system. Judicial relating to judgments made in a court of law. Okay, so God's declaration greater than a court of law <laughs> um, about our righteousness grounded in his perfection and in our faith, grounded in his perfection, God's perfection, not ours, 
his perfection and our faith has direct bearing on our relationship with him and manifests itself in our behavior <laughs> where we are conforming to his image. And so um, the holiness in position produces holiness in nature and practice. The holiness that we have in relationship with God then comes through to our position in Christ and in our practice in life. That's a whole lesson in itself. <laughs> and it's, it has to do with righteousness. And then we move, <laughs> shift gears, <laughs> and then we move to justification. And of course, our, my simple definition of that, justification, just as if I had never sinned. So we are justified before God. So the gospel is a revelation of God's righteousness. So the gospel is a revelation of God's righteousness. Now, the, the revelation is, it is that which God reveals. So whenever we have our forgiveness and whenever we are in this right relationship with God, a relationship that God reveals, it's not one that we create. It's important. Because a lot of the cults and a lot of other religions, they you know, it's all it's based upon what the people do, how they create and and satisfy the gods. Yes. Right. It works. Yeah. It, you know, we've got to do something in order for God to be happy with us. No, we live out the righteousness of God, living out his character, and, and it, it is pleasing to God. And these are the things we will be rewarded for in heaven. We talk about that on Wednesday night in the, in the judgment seat of Christ where all the righteous uh, stand before God and the works that they've done for God will be rewarded. So living out Christ in our life has a reward for it and also has the present power and, and uh, strength and relationship with God where we are able to stand. So we are, we are justified. Now, um, what else here? So God has, pre, God has pronounced us righteous and accepts us as if we had never sinned. God pronounces us righteous. See? His righteousness is imputed to us by faith, not by works. And then when that righteousness, we've confessed our sins and Christ forgives us of our sins, and that is the righteousness of God comes in his, and it is a judicial act. Uh, rela you know, it is just as a, as a legal document it is the righteousness of God imparted to us because we have faith in Christ and that, 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 that righteousness that God has imputed to us means that we are justified in the presence of God and that God pronounces us righteous and in that pronouncement it, that we are just as if we had never sinned, we are justified. So that's those two words. I can hear a resounding amen. <laughs> it's from all the thousands that are watching. <laughs> oh, it hurts my ears. No. <laughs> no. It's great. So, next, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. All the ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. No one gets away with ungodliness and unrighteousness. People will give an account of their lives. And um, it is called wrath. And um, it is defined by one scholar as a wrath, a wrath of God who would not love good unless he hated evil the two being inseparable. So when you're saying, well, how can a God who is loving, you know, put people in hell? Well, he doesn't put them in hell. They earned the right to go there. See, we, ha we, we accept the forgiveness of God, his provision to forgive us of our sins, and he, and, and he forgives us and he gives us entrance into, into heaven. Christ is our entrance. He is our, he is our, the, the gate. He is, no one comes to the Father but by me. So Christ is the one through which we get into heaven. So we don't get into heaven by 
our righteousness, but by his. But people earn the right to go to hell. The wages of sin is death. They, get, they, they earn the wages <laughs> to put them in hell. We accept the forgiveness of God to erase our sins and take away that sinful nature and gives us, as it were, permission to enter into heaven. Now, when it says that the, there is the wrath of God, it basically what it is saying is that um, God who would not love, okay, the wrath of God, he could not love good unless he hated evil. Hated evil. The two are inseparable. If you love good, you have to hate evil. You can't love good and love evil. You know, you can't serve God and mammon. You know, there's always those scriptures that talk about that whole thing of you can't do both. You, you, you have to either love one or hate the other. You know, you've got to, you can't have both. And God can't have both. He loves good. He hates evil, wrath. So it isn't a... Um, you know, love covers everything. You know, universalism is, well, God will bring everybody into heaven because he died for the sins of the world and everybody goes to heaven. <laughs> no. God hates evil. And uh, he has placed himself as the way, the truth, and the life that no one comes to the Father but by him. So, um, revelation, okay, we go on here. That the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Revelation is always the direct act of God. Uh, he has chosen to employ the visible universe to testify of his invisible existence. So when people are worshiping the, the stars and the trees and all that kind of stuff, they've, and they've missed it because they're, they're, they're looking. God has created the visible to speak to us about that which is invisible. Um, what else? Verse 20. I'll read it from uh, an amplified version. It says, There are things about God that people cannot see, his eternal power and all that makes him God. But since the beginning, those things have been easy for people to understand. They are made clear what God has made so people have no excuse for the evil they do. <laughs> Verse 20. So, um, what else? The outward creation is not the parent, but the interpreter of our faith in God. So what goes on outside is what interprets, like God created this place. We see the beauty of creation. You know, we don't worship creation, we worship God. Um, we'll move on. <laughs> uh, righteousness of faith, this is Romans 3.20. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So <clears throat> Paul's initial objective in this letter to the Romans was to ex expose Jews and Gentiles alike that they both are helplessly uh, under God's judgment. All of you, all of you have sinned. <laughs> okay, so all right, the Jews and the Gentiles—they're there and they're in conflict. And Paul says, "You've all sinned." You know, let's get this straight. <laughs> You're not one is not better than the other. There's no one without sin. Okay. That's how, he, that's how he levels the playing field here. He, he lets them all know that you all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the human race is, you know, all, you know the human race is totally depraved of God. So, um, Paul pursues the, the next objective of revealing the offering of God's righteousness through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So, you've all sinned, but... God has offered you his righteousness through Jesus Christ, okay, what we just spoke about. And the phrase without the law is placed forward in the Greek text 
But now, apart from the law, the, uh, Paul immediately sets forth the separation of divine righteousness from any works of the law. So the, the Jewish people, they were, you know, um, they were used to, and, you know, their whole system was built upon the laws and obeying the laws, you know, the, the, the sacrificial system, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, everything, you know, everything was done. If you did the laws, you were righteous. If you didn't do the ceremonial cleansings, you didn't do all the things that they had said. Those were the things that the Jews would look at and say, I did, I did, I done all this stuff. <laughs> I've done everything. I'm righteous with God, and, and there's none righteous, no, not one. Wait a minute, what about all that I've done? That doesn't make you righteous. Oh yeah, they, it was on the inside, they were still, they were still uh, same old pagans and uh, same old uh, hard-hearted individuals that didn't, they were still putting themselves in conflict with one another. Um, the law and the prophets bear witness. They anticipated and spoke of this great truth of justification by faith. Um, so God's righteousness has been made, been available through Jesus Christ. And, uh, although all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, all now have access, Jew and Gentile have access to God through Jesus Christ. Um, then in Romans chapter five, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. So the justification, justifi you know, that God's righteousness, our faith is opened up and his righteousness has come into our life and it is not my righteousness, it's God's righteousness and so therefore I am justified just as if I had never sinned because Christ has forgiven me of my sins. We have peace with God. Yeah. We have peace with God. God is not anxious about you. <laughs> He's not anxious about <clears throat> the election. <laughs> Had to bring that up. Uh, <laughs> he has it all under control. So he's not anxious one bit, you know. <laughs> so, so therefore, God's going to take, take, take care of the whole situation. So um, whenever we have a, the barrier of sin... Okay, we don't confess our sin or whatever. We keep the barrier of sin um, prevents the meaningful relationship that we have with God. So, if we don't have a meaningful relationship with God, we've got to stop and check the barriers. What's the barrier here? Is it just is there something that I've done that I haven't confessed? Is there some something that I'm doing that I need to change? Is you know, and it isn't. And later on, if we get there, oh, verse verse uh, Romans eight chapter. One, there, there is therefore now no condemnation. So the law of sin, I mean, so our sins are forgiven, then we have peace with God, and we're to have this relationship with God. And if there's a barrier, then we confess it. But if we're still uneasy in our relationship, we need to look at the condemnation. There's no condemnation, no condemning spirit to those who are in Christ. So let's deal with the condemnation. Um, not judged guilty. <laughs> no condemnation. We are not, I saw that hand. <laughs> she raised her hand, I saw it. <laughs> we, we can condemn ourselves, the, the devil's whispers in our ear i mean you know it can come from anywhere people can even friends and family can say you know you're no good you always were no good you know just look at you <laughs> condemnation oh no no yeah yeah god doesn't condemn us now, if God were displeased with us, he wouldn't give us a condemning spirit. He would, he would allow the Holy Spirit to convict us. Convict us. Conviction is, you know, oh, you know, that's that prick in the heart. Don't do that. <laughs> you need to get rid of that. You know, so God's would be, God's uh, dealing with an issue is not making you feel guilty. 
You see, that, that's the misconception in church. <laughs> if we can make somebody feel guilty enough, we can get them to do what they're supposed to. That the end justifies the means of getting there. <laughs> God doesn't do that. God doesn't make you feel guilty. We feel guilty because in the presence of a holy God, we feel guilty. <laughs> And that's, you know, when uh, um, the prophet Isaiah, whenever he sees God, you know, oh, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of, un you know, he feels all of this condemnation. But unclean lips, unclean people, <laughs> you know, there was all these things wrong. And, you know, so God convicts us of sin. The devil condem brings condemnation. They're two different things. Let's see if I have a, um, okay. Not judged guilty because in Jesus Christ, the law of the spirit that brings life made you. Okay. We're not judged guilty because in Jesus Christ, the law of the spirit that brings life is the one who has made you. So God who made us is not, and the one who brings us life is not going to do the condemnation. Um, so the law of sin and death is robbed of its power to bring believers again into bondage. No condemnation. Con condemnation is to bring believers into bondage. Tie them up. Um, the law, weakened by the sinful nature, could only reveal sin, but it had no power to deal with it. The law says you can't do this, and you did it, so the law says you're guilty. Okay, now what? There was nothing. There was a sacrifice for a covering, but there was no way to, you know, it had to be dealt with so in, in in for us the holy spirit makes real to us those things and the righteousness of god imparted to us brings about this right relationship with god justification gives us the power that the nature our nature changes which is changes our outward actions and opinions so being in christ jesus we assume walk not after the flesh but after the spirit um to be in christ no condemnation is to be in christ and to be in him means to walk in the spirit. The cloud of condemnation no longer ominously is over our head and the fear of death, not physical or spiritual, is gone. So this walking in the spirit is, um, is not being so heavenly minded that we can't do anything, <laughs> you know got to walk in the spirit i can't go to work today <laughs> you know no we walking in the spirit is walking in our daily lives in the spirit of god being conscious of the spirit of god with us um so we're making it to first corinthians <laughs> that was romans <laughs> this is apostol ap apostolic correction and counsel um for ye are yet carnal for, where, for whereas there is among you envying and strife. So in, in the other letter, Paul is establishing, you know, in Romans, he's establishing that we have come into a right relationship with God, Jew and Gentile. There's, you know, you, you got to let go of these things, get rid of your divisions and separations. Now, Paul writes to the Corinthians, and he's telling them that you are babes, you know, that you, you're, 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 you've not grown up in your faith. And the reason you've not grown up in your faith is because there's envies, strife, divisions. You're, you are carnal, and you walk as men. <laughs> you're, you're walking as if this were a, um, the organization of men, organized by men, you know. But this is not, the church is not an organization of men. It is the body of Christ. And he's telling them, you haven't grown up, you haven't grown spiritually, because this is what you're doing. You're, you're talking about each other. You are fighting with each other. You are envious of each other. There's divisions going on. You just better stop it and grow up. 
or else. <laughs> Suffer the wrath of God. God hates evil. You see, the wrath of God should never fear. We should never fear the wrath of God because the wrath of God is against evil. He loves righteousness. So when we talk about the wrath of God, it's not, he's not, he's not, we're not talking about us. We're talking about the people that, that hate God and are, are lying and stealing and cheating and, you know, all the conniving, and they are hiding the truth that is in their lives by their actions. And God is, there, God is going to punish them. They're going to receive the wrath of God. But so when we speak of the wrath of God, we're not talking about us. So we need to pray for those who are under the wrath of God that their eyes would be open and they could see the, the truth that's inside of them. Um, they will, for while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? They, they were dividing themselves up by telling, telling each other, I'm better than you are because I got my message from Paul. <laughs> and no, no, I'm better than you are. You're carnal. You're looking for strife. You're not seeing the unity that comes from knowing Jesus Christ. Verse 9, for we are laborers together. You know, you're not in this alone. You can't divide yourself up. We are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Notice that laborers work together, <laughs> not jealous or divisive. Um, uh, fellow laborers, uh, reward that uh, on, on the day each person would receive his own reward according to his own labor. We've talked about that on Wednesday night with Judgment Seat of Christ. We're going to be rewarded for our, our work with God. This is where, that's where this, uh, Paul writes about that. Um, oh, one other thing. I thought this was interesting. You know, me, farmer. Um, our being God's fellow worker rests on the truth that we are his husbandry. Okay? We are his husbandry. Um, his tilled, farmed, plowed land. Okay? Every time I hear, I think of plowed land, I think of me driving a tractor plowing the field. You know, I'm plowing the field. No. I'm the field. God is the one who plows me. <laughs> You know, and um, we are God's field into which he, he has planted the seed of the divine life. He has planted the seed of his word and of his spirit. He's planted that in our lives. You see, so he has, you know, all the occasions of our life, you know, our life is plowed, tilled, you know, planted, and sometimes it's no-tilled. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> to those of you who understand farming. Um, so we are, you know, we are um, the, the tilled land. And then he goes on, he says, well, you are God's building. <laughs> so you are the building. And God is the one who has, set, Paul says, I'm the one who set the foundation in Christ. Anybody who builds on this foundation and, and builds it wrong, they, you know, they're going to be judgment. So you need to um, pay attention because Paul, in the next section, he says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Who, who has come in with some magic way of taking the foundation that I built and suddenly the, that has the power to make you forget about the foundation that I built in Jesus Christ? Who has bewitched you? How did you come up with this? You knew this so well, and then you let somebody come in and, and feed you a line of garbage, and you swallowed it, and you're trying to build your, your life on this stuff that has nothing to do with what I taught you. <laughs> because you do not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Because people came in and they were, the Judaizers had come in again and they were trying to uh, get the, uh, the whole congregation there to go back to the law and to Judaism and to circumcision and how that Jesus Christ is part of the Jewish system of the sacrificial system. And 
the, the church here in Galatia, they're trying to, trying to go and bring that back in. And Paul says, who, who come in and bewitch you? Because, <laughs> you know, it's like they were appealing to the Jewish uh, community because there's probably a greater Jewish community of believers than there was a Gentile community. So the Jewish community was trying to exercise authority over the Gentiles to get them right with God by following the laws of Moses. Paul said, who bewitched you? <laughs> Had nothing to do with that at all. Then he says, which, which one of you received the Holy Spirit by uh, obeying the law? Show, I mean, show of hands, who, who, who here has received the Holy Spirit by obeying the law? Who here has received the Holy Spirit by faith? Oh. <laughs> and then um, resurrection. And if Christ, and this is, you know, and, and we'll finish with this. Um, Paul says, If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also in vain. You see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, these are not just good ideas. The scriptures that are here in the New Testament with Paul and even all the whole, the whole Bible, but as, as, as far as the New Testament goes and as far as the, the church and Jesus Christ and the writings in the New Testament, if Jesus Christ isn't risen from the dead, this is all in vain. That's what he's telling them. This is, you know, a lot of... The other religions, they may have good teachers and whatever, but their they're teachers and they're the ones who established their faith, they're dead. <laughs> they're gone. They didn't rise from the dead. But we have Christ, and Christ is risen from the dead, and he is the one who lives within our hearts and lives. And he says, if this life only we have hope in Christ. So if we only believe in Jesus in this life, you're a miserable person. Because if, if the life that we have in Christ isn't eternal, then let it go, Paul says. But you see, <laughs> but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. So Christ is risen from the dead, and he, you know, because he is risen from the dead, you too shall rise from that first fruits. And then, behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. And I never use sleep whenever we're talking about people dying because children think of it, they don't want to go to sleep at night. Why? Because Jesus is going to come and take me and I won't see you anymore. <laughs> don't do that. But sleep, people who die, die because of a reason. I always they tell them, you know, give them the autopsy report. Their heart stopped, whatever. But we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So when the, when the trump of God, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, twinkling of an eye is, is one one hundred thousandth of a second. <laughs> when your brain sends a signal to your eyelid, and before your eyelid responds, that's how fast you're going to be changed. Quicker than that. Here, gone. The last trump, for the trump shall sound and the dead shall be raised through incorruptible and we shall be changed. This mortal must put on immortality. So our belief in Christ and the understanding that we have with God and our forgiveness and his righteousness is imputed to us and the, his righteousness imputed to us is our justification. He wouldn't give us that. He wouldn't give us his righteousness if we still had sin. Our sin erases the barrier. Christ comes into our life. We are now justified, just as if I had never sinned, and that we have that lived out through our daily lives. And that as we live this out through our daily lives, God is there with us to strengthen us, help us, and grow us through each of our life situations. Amen. <laughs> so... So seeing that we must put on the immortality of Jesus Christ. We put on the immortality of Jesus Christ. He puts it on. We, we just transform. He gives us the new garments. Rhonda won't even have to pick out my shirt and pants. 
<laughs> Jesus will already put out new garments and we'll have it all set to go. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word that establishes our heart and gives us the right foundation that is in Christ and an understanding of these words that we see and hear. And, but Lord, they all speak of a right relationship with you, of forgiveness and of love, your hatred of evil, and God, your love for that which is good. So we ask you to be with us and do not allow that condemnation from ourselves or from the evil one or from wherever, do not allow it to work in our hearts and minds because in you, O oh God, there is no condemnation. So Lord, thank you for loving and forgiving and establishing our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In Jesus' name. What does that mean? Remember, a couple weeks ago, we place it in his hands. No, in Jesus' name. Jesus himself will answer our prayers. Something to that effect. In Jesus' name. Jesus himself will answer our prayers. Amen.